Hey everybody, this is uh, Professor D'Angelo and we're about to get into our uh, next installment for the Early American History uh, podcast that we're doing. Um, this is chapter 8 in the Tyndall and She book and uh, the focus of this is the emergence of what we call a market economy. So a um, couple things to keep in mind when you're reading this chapter is that um, this is one of these chapters where historians run into a problem. They cover a whole bunch of stuff in a historical time period. They get to the end of the time period and then they realize, oh man, you know, we forgot to talk about all this other stuff. And so they figure out a way to kind of like get it all in there and have it make sense. And this is one of those chapters. So it doesn't quite fit into the critical period, which is the time from the fighting of the revolution until um, America sort of establishes itself as an independent sovereign nation, which some people say it's 1801 and some people say it's 1815. This obviously just from the dates you see on the screen, uh, trans, you know, kind of goes away from that period. Um, problem, it doesn't really fit in the other period. I mean, it just didn't really fit. And so I wanted to uh, place this here as a demonstration of how things are changing in America. Now, the other thing you want to try to keep in mind is that um, when they talk about a market economy, they're talking about an overall uh, way in which an economy functions. And there are essentially three types. There are what we call traditional economies, which are essentially agricultural economies. There are what we call market economies, which operate on the free market system and the private ownership of property and the exchange of goods and services and all these other things that we would obviously recognize as a modern economy. And then there are what are we call command economies. And those are uh, socialist, uh, communist, and statist economies, something that you would see in, for instance, uh, North Korea, China, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Vietnam. Or California. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, so this is the uh, system that we're working with. So um, so in over the course of the 19th century, so both the United States and Europe are going to go into what we refer to as the Industrial Revolution. And this particular chapter is dealing mostly with um, uh, the early Industrial Revolution. Now, that date is fuzzy. Some people go as far back as the 1790s, which we'll have some stuff in here that goes back that far. And others say, no, it's 1815, 1820. And so the dates are a little um, a little fuzzy, right? So, um, so the market revolution that they talk about in the book is the, the moment when traditional economies transition into market ones. And so to kind of lay it out, in a traditional economy, because it's mostly agricultural, economic activity tends to be uh, seasonal, where there's planting season, there's nurture season, there's harvest season, and then there's dormant season. You know, there's these cycles. And um, even a commercial agricultural business is only getting an income once a year at the time of harvest. And that income then has to stretch. In a traditional economy, we have a mixture of currency and barter systems. So uh, some farmers are going to uh, sell their surplus products for cash, use the cash for other products or savings. But other people, particularly farther down on an economic uh, ladder, are going to resort to barter. They're going to take their excess or surplus produce and they're going to trade it for things that they want or need. And this is a traditional economy. Well, America shifts during this critical period to a market economy. And it is rather revolutionary because for a lot of people, um, it's, it's a very insecure feeling to go from a, an economic system that, let's face it, every generation in your family's history has become familiar with. And now you're going to shift to an economy where you are going to essentially work for someone else and earn an income and then use that income to buy the goods and services that you require. So this is giving up a certain amount of um, sovereignty, if you will, about your own uh, sustenance. Now, for a lot of people, it's an incredible liberation. Um, 
if you have had the experience of working on a farm, even if you do it one day, you will realize quite honestly just how difficult it is for a farmer to make a living. It is not an easy work and it is literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. There's just always something that needs to be done. Yep, sometimes it's slower, sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's very lackadaisical, and obviously you're your own boss, which has an amazing benefit to it, but it is not easy work. So we're going to see these kinds of elements, and what you want to do with this is to A, look at the innovations and how they are affecting economic activity. You B, you want to look at how it's affecting both uh, social and cultural norms, and then C, you want to look at what's happening to the political system in order to meet the demands of this new type of economy. So for the market revolution, it had to start off as an agricultural one. And I'm going to go over some of those innovations later. So before you can shift to a market system, you need an, a more efficient agricultural system because you're going to see uh, population growth. You're going to see uh, increases in, in um uh, demand for agriculture. So you actually have to produce more food with less resources so that those resources can be shifted to industry. So with that, then we're going to see a movement of people from rural areas to towns. So in 1800, we saw that 90% of the American population were living in rural towns. By 1815, essentially because of the war, more domestic industrialization is happening. And so people are moving into uh, towns and cities in order to meet that labor demand. And then, of course, as I just stated, this requires capital. So if I'm going to produce products in a factory, I need cash. I need cash to buy the raw materials. I need cash to hire the labor. And so we, we see the economy shifting to a strictly cash-based economy. So, industrial growth requires an infrastructure. And what you should notice in, in this um, text is the increased construction of roads. And with that is going to come a, um, let's just say, pressure on the governments, both at the state and federal level, to help that construction take place. So, we, uh, in the last chapter, you probably remember seeing the picture of Daniel Boone leaving people through the Cumberland Pass. This is going to become the Cumberland Road, which then becomes the, the Wilderness Road, and then becomes the National Road. And this becomes a uh, point of contention between Federalist and Anti-Federalist in terms of who has the power to make these roads. Is it federal power? Is it state power? Or is it concurrent power? Right, both of them do it. So, what happens in the meantime is the market itself answers the call for roads, and we get what are called toll roads. So, private people, right, would buy uh, strips of land, would build crushed gravel uh, roads along uh, that that land, and literally charge people to use it. And actually, this is where we get one of our snack favorites, right? If you are, um, you know, any kind of a child in this country, you're familiar with chocolate chip cookies. Well, um, if you notice, uh, there's something called a toll house recipe. And that came from the toll house or the toll road era that we're talking about here. Um, a woman, I believe it was in Massachusetts, she and her husband ran a toll road and their house where the, where the turnpike was. Uh, was called a toll house and she began selling food and other refreshments to people who were going to be traveling on the road and um, she uh, put together her toll house recipe for these cookies and now of course we have our uh, toll house cookie recipes right so anyway um, now water transportation has always existed obviously it's the oldest form of transportation that we really have in terms of commercial transportation. And so, um, pound for pound, floating a product is the cheapest way of transporting it. So in, in the United States, we see the beginning of the canal construction. This too becomes contentious 
Should federal governments be building canals? Should states have to do it? Should they be privately constructed? And if a canal has to get federal funding, what part of the canal? Is it the canal that just simply, is it the part of the canal that crosses state line, therefore an interstate project? Or is it, or is any of it eligible for federal support? And this becomes a very big deal. Uh, the the uh, governor of um, California, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the governor of New York State, uh, I believe it was DeWitt Clinton, gets fed up. He's just like, I'm, I'm not going to wait for these people to get their act together. And so New York will construct its own canal, which will become the Erie Canal or the, what is today the New York State Barge Canal, right? Along with this is an innovation called steamboats. Now, contrary to what some people think, the United States did not invent steam power. That was James Watt, which is where we get watts as a unit of energy and or unit of power rather. And that's the steam engine that he created in England. What Robert Fulton did in 1823 is he took that steam engine technology and applied it to a boat, as you see there in the photograph. Now, what is today just seen as sort of like a romantic little boat ride that you can do some gambling on and you're in the Mississippi River uh, was really an unbelievable innovation because now products could fly uh, float downstream but also float upstream so you um, could have river traffic going both with and against uh, the flow of the of the current in addition were clipper ships and I'll be showing you a picture of this in just a moment but essentially what happens here is that um, uh, these clipper ships were actually smaller than the uh, types of uh, cargo ships that had been constructed prior the key here was that the clipper ships had a faster keel and hull and better masting, and so the ships sailed quicker, and this allowed for uh, commercial products to uh, cross the ocean more quickly, and that's going to be a, a very big uh, plus for uh, American um, international trade. So if you can see here, our, our transportation map and this is uh, purposeful. If I look at this map, it's really important to look at how much road and canal construction is going on in the United States. But if you'll notice, it's almost exclusively in northern states. This is the beginning of a troubling trend that we're going to look at farther in this chapter. But clearly the north is taking advantage of these innovations and building infrastructure that the south is not doing. So here is a great little uh, painting from your uh, text, the Erie Canal. And you'll notice, right, this the lock is in there in the middle in the background there. That's how the boats went from one level of water to another. And you'll notice that there's construction of houses nearby. So the Erie Canal not only was an, a great innovation for moving products from the Great Lakes to New York City for export, um, it created jobs for people all along the route. Every time there was a lock, little towns came up. And so, um, you know, all sorts of uh, careers are going to be based on canal traffic. So the Erie Canal is, is really super important. Can finish in 1825. This canal really made the Great Lakes a viable uh, commercial area. I, you know, anything done in the Great Lakes area can now be sailed, or I should say floated, down the Erie Canal to New York City to be exported. If you remember, prior to that, things had to be float, floated down the Allegheny and the Ohio, onto the Mississippi, down to the Ohio, or to the uh, Port of New Orleans, and then from there. This canal turns New York City into the largest commercial headquarters for the United States and making New York the quote-unquote empire state. So um, now look at our railroads. Again, we get the same trend. Northern states, right, built like crazy. The southern states did not. And this is that separation of North and South that's going to contribute to this coming civil war that we'll be addressing in the next 
uh, unit. So um, railroads were initially used to connect canals. So because floating produce is the cheapest, they would float the stuff from one point A to point Z, and then a railroad would pick up the cargo at point Z and then uh, move it to another canal, point A, and then it would float down that, that canal. But uh, there's almost a 100% expansion of railroads by 1860. So um, this is a significant uh, shift in uh, how Americans uh, move and how their products move. And if you notice, this is going considerably west, right? So this is going to allow for settlement to go into those areas and for commercial growth to go back and forth, right? So time-effective transportation ends up moving railroads from being connectors to being sole transportation networks of their own. And that's because even though it's more expensive per ton uh, per se, the speed at which railroads could get products from point A to point B still made them more cost effective. So the government's role again becomes an issue. Um, debate over the federal role was whether or not federal money should be going in there. Federalists, of course, supported it. They believed that because the federal government has the power to regulate interstate commerce, that they would naturally have the power uh, to engage in railroad construction. Uh, Anti-Federalist or the Republican Party at the time, which is uh, mostly Southerners, believed that that was an unfair intrusion of the federal government into their states. And because most Southern states were still operating under a traditional economy, they did not see the long-term benefits of railroads. And this is going to um, uh, make a big uh, problem for the South when it comes to the Civil War. So the states that did decide to engage are going to offer tax incentives, but more importantly, most of them offered what are called land grants. So basically, they gave railroads free use of long strips of contiguous property that they could then build railroads on. But they didn't just give them that land. They gave them enough land where they could build a railroad and sell the excess land to uh, prospectors and, and uh, speculators and that would be used to offset the cost of constructing the railroads. So this um, sets off a lot of competition and, quite honestly, a lot of corruption. So um, stocks start to be offered to the public to help finance some of these railroads. And these stock offerings are going to become very popular. They're sort of going to be the uh, tech stocks of the 1800s. And they're also very volatile. And uh, there are going to be a couple of um, economic uh, disasters, most notably the 1857, that are going to be done in part because of railroad stocks. Here you can see the clipper ship, ship that I had spoken of earlier. And this is just simply a, a way of looking at it. And it, I don't know if you remember some of the earlier podcasts where we had these ships that just sort of like hulking uh, behemoths that were out there, and and that was done because you could you could carry so much produce. But the problem is the boat was so small that um, you had incredible amounts of waste. These clipper ships move quickly, and therefore um, your produce gets to the market uh, in a in a better and more uh, speedy manner, and 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 quite honestly, more profitably. Okay. So innovations in this new national economy, uh, the telegraph system is going to be the big, I think one of the biggest. It's 1830, F.B. Uh, Samuel F.B. Morris uh, comes up with a telegraph. This is copper wiring meant to, or I'm sorry, used to transmit tapped messages that have to be decoded. Um, this is an unbelievable innovation. Um, you have to remember, this is a time when a letter could take literally months to get from Maine to, you know, you know, uh, the capital of Washington, D.C. This is going to cut this down to days and this and in some instances overnight. That's phenomenal. And this innovation is um, significant. Now, what makes it 
um, I think interesting to study is that um, telegraph lines have to be, uh, you know, basically sent down long distances. Well, the natural place to put the telegraph line is along the railroad tracks. And so rail lines started to be uh, paid to allow for telegraph lines to go through. And that's why telegraph stations were always at train stations. So Western Union, which is still existing today, they, they used to have their offices were almost exclusively in train stations. And uh, now, what did that mean? That meant that the North is going to have more telegraph wiring than the South. And when it comes to fighting the Civil War, the North is going to be able to communicate between the field and the command centers uh, much more quickly and efficiently than the South. And that does have an effect. Uh, Elias Howe is going to come up with um, the earliest uh, sewing machine. And then it's going to be per, uh, perfected by a guy named Singer. So obviously you recognize that name. Um, it's, I'm sorry. It was Elias Howe and Isaac Singer. That's a, that's the names. But anyhow, uh, this is going to become a major game changer. The United States starts to engage in textiles. And this comes about because of a rather sly operation that I will be talking about later. But um, it's one thing to make the fabric. It's another thing entirely if you could take that fabric and turn it into clothing. And this is going to create a major industry in the United States that lasts for a very long time. In fact, it really is still going even into the 1980s. So uh, the next is vulcanized rubber. This is a guy named Goodyear. Uh, this is a, uh, a technological process. And this is going to really revolutionize so many things just in terms of industrial machinery for transportation vehicles like um, wagons to have better wheels. I mean, there's just all kinds of different things that are going to be uh, significant for this. But as I stated earlier, none of that's going to matter if you can't have innovations and advancement in agriculture. And this is going to be, of course, um, the steel plow. This is John Deere. So if you're uh, if you were like me, the the young kid who had to mow the lawn, uh, John Deere is the person you vilify probably, but he invents a steel plow. Now, what has happened here, and I think it's kind of significant, is Eli Whitney had come up with an innovation called interchangeable parts, where he was able to demonstrate with nine rifles that he could disassemble them, mix the parts up, and reassemble nine rifles. This innovation is critical for the whole idea of mass production. John Deere does a part of this because the plows at the time were made out of um, were made out of iron, and these were uh, products that could actually see the blades break. And if the blade broke, you had to replace the entire plow. What Deere does with the plow is he uses steel, which is a much more durable material. He fans the blades and he makes it so that if something goes wrong, you can simply replace the blade. So he's, he's making an, a highly commercial product that is going to cut the time necessary for plowing by just phenomenal numbers. The next one is Eli's Whitney's other innovation, which is the cotton gin. And as you can see on this uh, slide, there is a photograph of his original patent. And the, it's, it's a very simple operation, but it's unbelievably significant and has enormous implications in the United States. So the idea here is cotton is a very, um, well, I should say, was a very high demand commodity. Uh, basically an Egyptian thing, but the product was very difficult to manage. Uh, the better quality cotton, the more embedded the seeds are inside of the cotton bowl, and that's B-O-L-E, right? So um, initially, uh, farmers who tried to cultivate cotton 
would actually have to sit the slaves down in circles and they would take handfuls of cotton and literally pick through the cotton, which took forever. And so we have a cotton pick in minute. So it would take a slave a very long time to get a very minimal amount of cotton. So Eli Whitney was visiting a, a, a Yale colleague in the South, witnessed this and thought, geez, that seems really dumb. Why would you do that? And what he did is he invented this, this machine, an engine, which we call the gin, cotton gin. And you simply dump the uh, cotton through a hopper at the top of the machine and a roller with metal fingers simply take the cotton and spread it out and the seeds would drop to the bottom into a tray that you could pull out and then save the seeds for, for planting. It's an unbelievable device. Now, um, unintended consequences here are enormous. Prior to the cotton gin, which first gets its patent, I believe, in 1793, but I, I could be a few years off there, um, was meant to simply help get a product done more efficiently and with less labor. The result, however, was a huge boom in cotton in what we call the Old Southwest, which is going to be Mississippi, Alabama, parts of Louisiana, um, and Georgia. And uh, it's it's depressing. Uh, the cotton gin is essentially what revitalized the institution of slavery. Um. Many Southern slave owners had started to contemplate life without their slaves. Um, if you follow just plain capitalist principles, slavery is not an effective and efficient means of production. It isn't because you're, you're basically have the cost of labor, even when labor's not doing anything, when they're babies, when they're children, when they're old and, and you feed and clothe or house, right? This is, it's a stupid system. It, it actually, regardless of the fact that some very few people made a lot of money, the economy itself suffers. And some, some in the South knew this. Plus, let's face it, there's a moral stigma to owning other people. But the cotton gin made Southern, Southern slaveholding, it made it profitable again. And the really tragic thing of this is, uh, if you remember from the last chapter, after 1808, we could not import slaves anymore. So now each slave became more valuable. And what can only be described as moving an institution from immoral to diabolical, we now get slaveholders breeding slaves. And more importantly, we see northern slave owners who are moving away from slavery because as, as uh, tobacco or wheat or other types of producers, the, the uh, innovations like the plow and others are going to make it sort of stupid to have slaves because you just didn't need them. But rather than freeing them, they sold them down south. So, um, you know, over 835,000 slaves were quote unquote sold south, or as some people said, sold down river. And it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, for instance, Thomas Jefferson, when he dies, he, he's so in debt that the family sells all their slaves and they all go south. Uh, it's, it's just, um, it's something that you can't get your mind wrapped around without just really being disgusted. Cyrus McCormick create something called a reaper. Um, it's kind of hard to explain if you haven't worked on a farm, but anyway, um, McCormick's reaper quadrupled the rate at which a field could be harvested. Now, if you, if you can imagine that an average American football field is approximately one acre, imagine being able to, to harvest four of those and in, in less time than it took you to, to harvest one. It's phenomenal. McCormick is going to become a bajillionaire and it's going to be a highly sought after product, 
right? But as I stated earlier, these sites of innovations, we still see the expansion of slavery. And it's, uh, and in my opinion, and I'm willing to be corrected if somebody has contrary evidence, without the cotton gin, without cotton as king, it, it's not happening. It, it just would not have happened. And um, now, the one thing that we do see is expansion of farming in the West. So as I you know, showed you earlier with the railroads connecting out there, it now became viable for people getting very large land concessions to become commercial agriculturalists. And what that means, by the way, is you might have a small plot of ground to grow your vegetables and have cows and chickens and all this other stuff. But the vast majority of your production is production solely for sale. And now with the railroads, all of that can be transported east quickly and efficiently and be put for sale. And so the, the West, or what we today are going to call the, the sort of um, corn belt, right, and the wheat belt, the, the great agricultural heartland of America, gets its start in this time period. And very quickly, by the way, becomes one of the leading exporter of um, agricultural products in the world. So here we get a look at the population density. So we look at the end of our last chapter, right? And you can see what's happening here. And I think it's important to realize that after the War of 1812 ends in 1815, it becomes incredibly uh, popular to move west. And you see this incredible density of population, and then it just, boom, explodes out into the West, right? So America, ever since the colonial period, is still doubling every 25 years in population. That's phenomenal growth. So, the Industrial Revolution really comes in our country in the lap of the textile industry, as I was talking about earlier. So we go back to 1819. Samuel Slater was an Englishman who worked in the British textile industry. Now, Britain considered textiles a, uh, a strategic industry. Uh, the British had, starting with wool, created a, a, a very aggressive wool industry and textile industry that was, that was in many ways dominating the globe. So it was literally illegal for people to see the blueprints of textile factories. It was illegal for people like Samuel Slater, who was uh, a worker in these industries, to leave England without permission. Slater memorizes the blueprints, memorizes them, doesn't copy them, memorizes them, and then uh, sneaks out of England and goes to Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Now, you think about this for a second. And then from memory, builds a textile loom, right? To start a textile industry in the United States. I mean, it's unreal. So this is a major transformation of Eng New England. So if you guys remember, New England started off as kind of like a podunk backwater English colony for trees and fish. And then we learned how to build ships and became merchant sailors. Well, now we're learning how to be uh, industrialists. And New England is going to become submerged in this textiles system. And uh, the heartland of this is going to be a place called Lowell, Massachusetts, right? And the... Um, the main way of generating power here is going to be using water. So, you know, what we now see is these really romantic old buildings along rivers with the wheels that turn and the water going through, right? That was actually done to generate power. So these textile plants would have to be located near rivers. And then part of the water from the river would be diverted into a, into a uh, water wheel and then would have a mill pond that would then drain back into the river. And uh, now, this had some implications as well. It's actually quite interesting if, you know, you're a nerd like me and find such things interesting. But uh, anyway, um, what happened was a lot of states either permitted companies to dam up the rivers 
or did it themselves. And so they created dams to create uh, more water pressure so that when the water was released to go through the wheels, they would move more rapidly and quickly with greater force. And um, that served a great purpose, but it literally destroyed ecosystems. So a lot of the, I mean, these are enormous rivers, by the way, um, the, Nantuck, the Narragansett River, the Connecticut River, right? These are enormous rivers and even smaller ones. And what it does is it disturbs the uh, migration patterns of fish and especially um, salmon. And it, it just, it destroys um, entire fisheries. Um, so, you know, and I've only read one of these articles, but I actually find it kind of heartening. A lot of New England uh, communities and states are blowing up these, these um, dams and uh, trying to encourage the ecosystems to um, revitalize, which is just awesome. Uh, so the Lowell system uh, had a problem. They needed cheap labor. And um, they turned to young unmarried women. Now, uh, we've talked about the this concept of status and agency, where status is the amount of value you have within a society and agency being the amount of voice you have in society, particularly when it has to do with your own destiny. Now, in traditional economies, young women were seen as a burden. They weren't yet married, but they were too old to sort of like be children. Uh, so they lived at home. They helped out with chores. They helped to teach children. Uh, some will be uh, teachers, but for the most part, uh, they sat around and waited for their father to find a good match for them for a marriage. And um, they really didn't have a whole lot of choice. And fathers were pretty heavily pressed after a girl turned 16 to try to arrange for something to happen so that everything took, you know, took its normal course. Well, when New England converts to this market economy and the textile industries need this young labor force, they had to find a way of encouraging fathers to allow their daughters to leave home unescorted. And so they actually built dormitories at their factories with house mothers. And the women would come, live in these dorms, would be, uh, you know, they wake up in the morning and they would have breakfast together. They would go in and they would work. They had their breaks. They would go back to the house. There were Bible studies. They were all required to go to church on Sunday. Uh, they were chaperoned anywhere they went in social environments by the house mom. And this was a way of dealing with the social norms of the period um, and obtaining this workforce. The photograph here is of uh, what were called Lowell girls. And now... If, if you are a normal modern person, you have to look at that and be like, oh my God, that is so exploited, right? I mean, this exploitation is ridiculous. But here's the thing. These young women who normally had no voice whatsoever were now earning money, most of which went back to the, her family. Dads are now earning income for the household from their daughter's labor. And guess what happens? The dads aren't in such a hurry to find them a man. The dad might want them to get married and be looking for them to get a husband, but it's not as pressing of an issue. These women start to gain more status because they're adding more to the bottom line of the family's income. And this has important implications for them. Is it the kind of status that we would expect a woman to have? Absolutely not. But for the time period, it was a big change. And women were having more say or agency in who they married and when they married. So a woman could technically go home and say to their dad, you know what? I'd rather wait and go back and work in the factory. And dads were kind of like, okay. So um, 
The system works for a while. Now, what destroys the Lowell system, quote unquote, is the influx of Irish immigrants in the 1840s and 50s that's going to bring in um, single young girls who are not with parents and are willing to work for the same wage, if not less, and don't require any of that additional expense. And that is what eventually uh, ends that system. So for cities, uh, industrialization requires a consolidation of manufacturing, right? You're going to put all your production in one facility and that concentration leads to, you know, uh, larger urban areas. Now, transportation improvements like the trains and the railroads allows for that to happen because now people can move back and forth more efficiently. There's also going to be something called the omnibus, which is basically a larger wagon pulled by horses that is going to be uh, have several benches on it and ride up and down city streets for people to jump on on. So it was called an omnibus, but today we just call it a bus. Um, and then, um, so obviously a lot of these cities are going to be located on water sources because of the requirement for water power. Uh, but um, these cities are now going to grow in larger and larger numbers. So if we look at our map here, now in the 1840s, you begin to see where um, principal industrial areas are going to see multiple new cities growing, even in places that were traditionally very rural, like Pittsburgh and Cincinnati, right? They're now going to have um, increasingly industrial uh, and, and uh, excuse me, and urban development going on. So with the, with the increase of towns and cities comes the increase of popular culture. So um, during the 1830s, boxing became a popular form of entertainment. Um, taverns and saloons also sprang up to meet the um, desire of the social drinker. Theaters provided a primary outfit for American um, entertainment. The, uh, the entertainment that you see on here is um, a mixed bag, if you will. These are um, what we... Uh, are going to be part of urban recreation, right? But um, uh, as, I, as I said there, boxing was becomes popular. Horse racing has been popular ever since the colonial period. Um, but the performing arts, um, we see really two different... Well, there. I, I don't want to use high art, low art, because that's not fair. But um, Shakespearean plays have been very popular in the United States for a very, very long time. And professional theaters had been set up for that purpose ever, ever since the colonial period. They do become increasingly popular now. And Americans become very unique. Um, uh, I guess the word rude comes to mind. So American audiences were very loud and very boisterous. They would memorize lines from uh, the Shakespearean plays. They would pick favorite actors and follow their performances. It's really bad. So if you were, say, an actor and you're in, um, you know, you're in, uh, you know, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and you're performing Shakespeare's uh, Henry V, but people really, really liked you in, a, um, in Shakespeare's um, Hamlet. So you'll be up there performing and people in the audience would literally yell out, do scene five and, you know, whatever. And the actor would have to stop their performance, go out and literally say their lines from Hamlet. Everybody roars and cheers and claps and then he bows. And then when everybody calms down, he goes back and starts doing his play. I mean, this is the kind of crap that Americans were doing, right? Because they got really into it. There's going to be a riot in New York City between supporters of an American and an English actor where people are actually killed. This is, this is how ridiculous it gets. Now, what's on the screen are the Crow Quadrilles. This is minstrelry, which becomes unbelievably popular in the United States. This is a direct descendant of African music and uniquely African-American music, slave music. And these uh, instrumentals became very popular. And what happens is... Um, uh, people want to hear the music, but uh, blacks were not allowed to perform for whites. So um, white musicians 
Uh, most notable one among them is going to be a um, uh, a, 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 an uh, Irish immigrant, Stephen Foster. He's going to go and learn all this music and then go out and go around and perform music and sell sheet music for profit. These were these minstrel shows became very popular, more popular in the north than they were in the south, by the way. And they were horrible caricaturizations of black people. So notice it's called the Crow Quadrilles. Crow was a euphemism for a black slave. And um, so in the in the um, colonial period, they would say things like crows for sale, which basically was coded language for I have slaves to sell. So this is a very degrading terminology. So white musicians would um, cover themselves in blackface. This is burning corks and then rubbing it on their face so that it looks black, leaving huge loops around their eyes and lips to accentuate them as caricature of black people, and then would act in ways to um, denigrate black characters. The leader, the one, the most famous of them, was an MC for one of the quadrilles called Jim Crow. And he was all of the negative characteristics. He was hunched over. He shuffled. He's lazy. He's so stupid he doesn't get the stories right. And that's the whole comedic effect. And um, this is where the anti-African American laws, Jim Crow laws, comes from. From this minstrel show character. However, it must be stated that black music, however, became incredibly popular. It was... It was um, very sought after music. People, uh, musicians, everyday Americans would run out and buy the sheet music and try to uh, learn it and play it. It was it was a widely popular deal. Here we see the uh, bare knuckle boxing, which was the style until really the early 1900s. Uh, now, um, so oftentimes when I uh, teach this class, it's easier to do when it's a face-to-face -face course because I draw a big, huge eye on the board. And I say, you know, when it comes to industrialization, the eyes have it. You need industrialization, you need infrastructure, and you need immigrants. So here we go, right? There's a lot of turmoil, both economic and political in Europe. And that turmoil results in immigration to the United States. Now, in 189, uh, excuse me, 1845, an epidemic referred to as the Potato Famine uh, strikes Ireland. Um, and over a million people are going to die. By 1850, 43% of the foreign-born population in America are going to be Irish. Now, they are going to come primarily, right, uh, they are going to come primarily to urban areas. And that's because virtually all of them had zero money. And so they are going to come as individuals. Uh, and But they come with a plan. They come into urban areas. They earn money. They save money. They send it back to Ireland. Another sibling comes. The two of them work together. They save more money. They go back and they send for more, right? And that's how they, they uh, handled their their immigration crisis and then continued to send money home to those who did not want to leave or could not leave. And this is a huge connection between the United States and Ireland. Now, uh, this is not welcomed in the United States and you can see it here in a, um, a cartoon from the time period where Irish immigrants are seen as infiltrating the United States and bringing with them evil Catholic papal dogma that's going to undermine the government. And so um, British are going to, or excuse me, I'm sorry, Irish immigrants are going to be harassed. Believe it or not, they are not, not considered white. Uh, they are going to uh, be denied jobs, housing. It becomes very common for people to post an acronym, N-I-N-A, Nina, on their uh, billboards and their uh, wanted posters. So there would be signs in, in business stores that say, help wanted, Nina. And that meant no Irish need apply. 
Same for housing. Room for let. Nina. No, Irish need apply. And this continues for a long time until the Democratic Party recognizes that these Irish are large in number and will eventually be voters. And this is going to change uh, the fate of, of uh, Irish immigrants in the United States. Uh, now, the Germans, however, are coming under a different sort of uh, circumstances. They were usually more educated than their Irish counterparts. And um, so uh, they were coming mostly because of political upheaval in the German states. Uh, this is mostly because Prussia was expanding and was causing all kinds of turmoil and intrigue and, and um, uh, you know, really oppressing people. And so Germans who would have some means, right, would come to the United States, but they tended not to stay in urban areas. Uh, many of them came in families or even whole communities, and they had already bought land in the interior of the United States and landed in New York or Philadelphia or whatever and moved directly to their interior areas. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, their situation, you know, with the political unrest and having money meant that they had a, they could go out into these rural areas and they created little towns. And I actually have some direct connections. Um, my mother's family is, is from German immigrants. And... Um, uh, she grew up in a town called Johnsonburg, which was a major German and Scandinavian um, Lutheran settlement. Right next door to that was a town, or is a town, St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, which was German Catholic immigrants. And it's sort of interesting. They had German newspapers. They had, um, uh, for instance, the, the, the catechism of my grandfather in the Lutheran church was all in German. Uh, so it's sort of it's sort of a, an interesting uh, narrative, right? So um, so during that same time period, however, we have to remember German citizens continued uh, to come, and um, so Scandinavians started to come in about in over like seventy some thousand of them, and we see the beginnings of Chinese immigrants who are coming primarily to California, uh, especially after the gold rush. They're going to be about 35,000 of them by 1860. So still not a lot, but in, in a state like California, they're going to be a rather large impact. So uh, now, um, with immigration came the birth of another lovely American tradition called nativism. And um, uh, there's racism here, but I want to be really super careful because if I think of Irish, German, British, Scandinavian people, I'm not sure I could use the word ant, you know what I mean? It, it, because these people are, you know, white. These, you know, um, I don't know how to be more delicate about it, right? These are incredibly white people. But believe it or not, they're going to be ostracized as, as alien, um, non-white. And so we get this very interesting construct what does it mean to be white in America? And essentially what it means in the 19th century context is a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant or WASP construct. And were any of these groups to not fit that, they were ostracized. They were not wholeheartedly welcomed into the United States, which is why many of them chose to go out West. Now, um, nativism has a very specific terminology, and I want everyone to be very clear with it. Nativism simply means that the full benefits of citizenship should be afforded solely to people who are native-born citizens. So there's all sorts of degrees on this spectrum. There were many people who were like, just no immigration at all. They wanted it completely stopped. These people were xenophobic and wanted it not to happen. At the other end of the spectrum where people were like, well, no, they can come here, but they just don't understand our ways. So they shouldn't merely be full citizens. But now their kids that are born here and raised here, they can be citizens, right? So it's this bizarre spectrum of everything in between. But it becomes so strong that there's actually going to be a political party, a third party formed called the Know Nothings. Now, their uh, official name was the Sacred Order of the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, they would meet in secret. 
and their members were sworn to not reveal anything that was discussed in the meetings. If they were ever asked by anyone what happened, they were to say, I know nothing, which is why they get this term, the know nothings. Um, they are going to run candidates. Some will get elected to state legislatures and governorships and mayors, uh, but obviously they never become a full uh, force in national politics. Thank goodness. Um, now, with industrialization comes organized labor. So we, we have to know that early unions were based on skilled tasks. Now, skilled labor simply means that there's some sort of technical training and expertise that goes with doing the work. So um, uh, cigar makers, seamstresses, um, teamsters, these were guys who rode the big cargo wagons because you had to actually know how to steer anywhere from four to um, eight hor horses. This is a very difficult thing to do without the whole thing tipping over. Uh, if you're th trying to think of what I'm thinking of, think of the uh, Budweiser Clydesdale horses. That guy that's steering them is called a teamster because it's a team of horses he's steering. Uh, today, teamsters still exist, but it's about semi-truck drivers. So um, what happens is that the early labor movement gets stalled because a fight kind of breaks out between organizers, between skilled and unskilled workers. So with mass production one is able to break down the task of making something into its various smaller parts. So it became quicker to simply take any person out of the street and show them how to cut one simple pattern and then just do that repeatedly over and over and over again. And then somebody else did another piece and then somebody else sewed those pieces together. And then eventually you had the full product, the finished product. It was a value added process. So in some cases, like in the picture that you see here, you might have one big room where everybody's working and what's happening is either the product moves from station to station or the workers would go to the center and add value to the product. So it was this weird um, deal, the, but the benefit was you could produce more product quicker and cheaper. But then for people who were skilled laborers, that was a threat to their income because now they were being undermined by cheaper labor. So we get the beginning of national trades unions in 1834. And that's, and so what I want you to kind of imagine is these are people who are cigar makers all getting together so that no matter who's making cigars, they had to pay the same wage or people who were hiring uh, teamsters or seamstresses, um, Cooper Smiths, right? All these different types of jobs that required certain skills. Uh, that had to come into play. So labor politics comes in here because um, workers very quickly started to get exploited, uh, particularly wage employees. So um, another, uh, they were really regional, to be quite honest. They, they were never national quite yet, but we had what were called working men's parties. And these were groups who would go out and try to vote in blocks and try to get um, uh, uh, politicians to latch on um, for um, their issues. And this was almost exclusively at the state level. Now, as I stated earlier, women were getting into the workforce, particularly in the Lowell system. And so as women became more necessary for industrial output, they started to demand for more voice in the system. And this begins this call for the franchise. So we get now the rise of professions. So let's start with mine, teaching. Now, in the earliest period of America, um, it was almost exclusively a religious-based system. So for instance, if you remember, New England was the first area to require primary schools. And that was back in the 1600s. And that was because the, the uh, uh, congregational church required everyone to read and know the Bible, and you needed to be literate. And so they set up an education system in order to make sure that happened. Now, this meant in other parts of the country that was not a uniform reality, and this is obviously going to cause problems. Now, um, what happens, of course, is uh, there was a need for teachers. 
So what happened? Oftentimes, young men, many of whom finished a formal education, would have what I'm going to call a gap in their professional career. So because they were educated and because they were um, able to follow certain standards of learning, they would be hired to become uh, schoolmasters, right? So it was originally young men, but um, industrialization is going to change that because the demand for educated men grew dramatically. So now young men could would be leaving college at, which at that point meant you were like maybe 16, 17 years old, in some cases 18 or 19, depending on what you were doing. Um, you, you could just move off and get jobs in, in business and industry and in the professions that supported those things, um, which was obviously more lucrative. And so we went to the traditional, what we call school marms, right? Um, young women, unmarried, who had formal education, meaning they finished probably up through the eighth grade or ninth grade, would be teachers. Now, they would teach until they got married. And as soon as they were married, the expectation was that they would leave the school and go and become wives and mothers. Now, when their children were all grown and left, it was not uncommon for those women to go back to the schoolroom and it was also common for women who chose not to get married, right, to stay as teachers, right? And this becomes sort of the standard. And really, even today, education is still a very female-dominated uh, profession. However, in this period of time, the Secretary of Education for the state of Massachusetts, Horace Mann, uh, started to talk about teaching as a career. And... Um, he will recommend reforms that are probably very common to all of us. It's not a surprise that this is happening in Massachusetts because there's this huge tradition of education. And basically, he does a number of things. First, Massachusetts becomes the first state to make education a compulsory thing, meaning all the children had to go. They're the first to make it financed by public money, meaning tax, tax system. And uh, the third is that um, uh, uh, man set up uh, state schools to train teachers. So these were essentially teacher colleges. Um, San Diego State, for instance, here where I'm at in San Diego, started off as a teacher's college. And so this is a place for people to go to get spe specialized training to be involved in that profession. Now, when it came to law, medicine, and engineering, original originally, Everybody got the same college degree. Everyone did. Today, we call these your general education courses. So everybody took physics and, and calculus and all these other different, right? You know, French and Latin and Greek and all this other stuff, right? They, you took all these and it was all exactly the same. It's where we get the thing, the Harvard Yard. It was three feet of, of um, uh, bookshelf that had all the books that everybody had to master before they graduated from Harvard. And so everybody graduated the same thing. Once you graduated then, you went and apprenticed with somebody in the profession you wanted to be in, whether it was law, medicine, or engineering. You simply went in and tagged into uh, you know, these gentlemen, and you learned their craft. And then um, if you were fortunate, uh, for instance, in law, you would help him with clerking and you would help him with preparation for cases. And then after a while, he would give you your own clients to work with. And this became the base for your own practice. And then eventually he either set you off with maybe a few of your own clients and you were kind of off on your own, or he would retire and you would pay him essentially was a sort of a pension for his clients and you would take over his business. The same was true in medicine. And so um, what happens though is starting in this time period, the early 1800s, people started to demand for specialized professional standards in education. So we start to have law schools and med schools, engineering curriculums, right? So uh, this is a major innovation at the time. Again, industrialization is requiring more specialization. And so people wanted uniform standards 
so that everybody's you know uh, moving forward with the same skills. For women, however, this is um, not an easy road. Now, to be sure, we are going to see women doctors. We're going to see women who are in the law profession. We are going to see women who are engineers. We're going to see women who are um, very high in education levels. This is, it is not to say that it's not happening. But systemically, professions were, for the most part, out of reach of women. However, we do see the beginning of women's roles, right, in the professions, particularly in education. We're going to see all women's schools start to be formed, Smith, um, uh, uh, Swarthmore, uh, Bryn Mawr, right, Mills College in California. All of these other institutions will start to be developed in the 1800s in order to give women the higher education levels to make them capable of handling higher careers in the professions. So as you can see here, right, the eyes have it. We have innovation, we have immigration, right? We have infrastructure. And so, um, and, and in all of this, right, we're creating a very new America and transitioning from one period to the other. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of growth. There's a lot of great stuff going on, but there's also a lot of fear and trepidation a lot of corruption and scandal. There's a lot of um, ups and downs in the economy where people are going to be wiped out totally in their professions and lose all of their wealth. Uh, other people are going to become multimillionaires, right? So it's it's a tumultuous time and it's going to be um, exciting times. So um, with that, we get to the end of our second unit of this course. Um in what was referred to oftentimes as the critical period, America has at this point now clearly stood out as its own sovereign independent nation with a thriving economy. And so um, the next time we meet, we'll be talking about uh, the rise of Andrew Jackson. <laughs>